black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage, all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Zia! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight as we look back at the best of Sasquatch Chronicles. Thank you so much for being here on a holiday weekend. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. And I got to tell you, it was so hard to narrow down 10 episodes that were my favorites. I had about 50 set aside, and I was kind of struggling which ones to pick. And I didn't want to do like a six-hour podcast because no one's going to listen to a six-hour podcast. Uh, So I tried to pick out the ones that really stood out to me there was many more trust me there was many many more uh but i really hope you enjoy the show tonight if you've had an encounter shoot me an email my email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com and if you get a chance check out sasquatchchronicles.com you can become a member get additional shows i wanted to put something out for you guys it's the holidays not everyone has uh, great holidays you know sometimes people don't have families to go to and it's a lonely time of year So, and even if you have a family to go to, thanks so much for hanging out with me tonight. Um, My first show I want to play for you is episode 110. And I spoke to James, and this happened in Arkansas, I believe. And this encounter took place a long time ago, like 40 years ago. And it was kind of the first time he had shared this encounter when he was a young man. Then one of the creatures actually stepped out and attacked him. He pulled out his 22, shot it in the head. Take a listen. All right, well, it was the Friday after Thanksgiving, 1997. It was just tradition that I uh, go to the lake, lake area that we had a cabin at for deer season, and it started Thanksgiving Day in Oklahoma. And so I'd go on Friday, and it was Friday. I'd driven down, gone to the cabin, uh, went out, and there was a there's a power line easement that I've generally hunted, you know, and it was on the side of, well, what we call a mountain. It's not really a mountain. It's just a ridge, a high ridge. And uh, I went out. I parked the truck down by the road on the end of this easement and would catch deer crossing over. And it started feeding on acorns. And so I set up in the corner because the easement runs north and south. And in the corner that I would hunt, it would cut back west. And so I was sitting right in the corner so I could look west and then I could look north and downhill. And I got out there, I don't know, 11 noon. I got out kind of late and I sat and just, you know, waited in the corner, you know. Uh, there was some odd noises that I'd heard, but I just kind of checked them all off, you know, just weird whistles, odd sounding birds that I'd heard throughout the day and didn't really think nothing of it, and finally, I, it was getting to be how ah, four o'clock or so, and I was just tired of sitting there. I didn't think of them see me, so I got up and started walking back to the truck. And I can see the truck; it's about yeah, I par- probably parked uh, a couple hundred yards from where I left the truck. And uh, I was walking back, and I probably got about halfway to the truck. And suddenly I see kind of at a 45-degree angle across. I'm walking 
the south side of the uh, the power line easement, kind of up against the trees. And on the south side of me, or north side of me, at about a 45 degree angle, I see some movement. And then I see something moving, and then the next thing I know, a rock hit me dead center of the chest, about the size of a baseball. And this thing came in with a lot of force. And right just about the second that it hit me, this thing just screams. There's no roar, just a loud scream, extremely loud. And, of course, I look, and I can see it. It's 20 or 30 yards into the trees, and it's running towards me. And it gets to the edge of the trees, kind of throws out its right arm and hooks the tree and starts running back into the woods. But it, and it's still screaming. And then I'm shaking so bad, uh, I end up dry, try, take a step forward. I drop my rifle. I trip over my rifle. I break it. I broke the scope off of it. I finally get it together enough that I get it up, and I'm shaking. And, uh, man, I'm shaking now. Again, talking about it. And I'm trying to get to the truck. It's all I can do to go. You know, it's like my body's half paralyzed. As I get to my truck, I lay the rifle and the scope in the back. You know, I didn't really lay it, just kind of chucked it. And I always left my keys in the bed of my truck because one time I lost them while I was hunting. They fell out of my pocket and I had to walk back out and dig through leaves and find them. But I, I left them, I left them in the back of the truck. Well, I got my keys. I'm fumbling through the door trying to get it unlocked. I dropped the keys and I kind of half-ass fall down trying to get the keys and as I get the keys the next thing I know the truck is moving and I look up and I'm kind of down on one knee on my side and this thing comes up over the side of the truck uh the one hand on the driver's side rail of the bed and you know his body's just up on the bed of the truck and he's screaming at me well, I I always carried a little twenty two Magnum, an H and R, in a shoulder holster that I used to dispatch if I ever needed it to, you know, dispatch a deer that was maybe wounded, you know, it was just simple, it's easy headshot. Well, I was able to get it pulled out. I got it pulled out and uh I come around and I fired it and shot right above its left eye on the uh, left side of the face. And as I did, it lets out a, a scream and then off of the truck, blazing through the woods, screaming. It, it sounded like buffalo or elephants that, you know, just tromping, just screaming through the forest. And I was able to, at that point, still real shaking, get in the truck, get it started, and down the hill I go. I'm headed down the hill. And there's a creek at the bottom of the road. And right as I get on the on the bridge of the creek, the truck, there's a big bang, the truck rocks. I just kind of keep going, and I look back in the rearview mirror. And there was a boulder about the size of a soccer ball laying in the middle of the road. It wasn't there when I crossed the bridge. Well, I was actually kind of laying out on the bridge. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to drive over it with my truck. I probably would have bottomed out or it would have hit the bottom of the truck. It was that size. So I know it wasn't there before I went across the bridge. And then as I was on the bridge, you know, I, I'm assuming that it threw this rock and hit the truck, and I didn't see where the rock came from. I went home. I didn't sleep. Uh, went, it was about a half mile to the cabin. And the next day my dad came out and then, uh, I didn't hunt. Uh, I went, in fact, I got up the next morning and, uh, just packed up and went back to town. I told, I told my dad I wasn't feeling well and I wasn't going to hunt. You know, and, uh, you're, you're the first person I've <laughs> ever told the whole thing to, you know. Uh, I've told people that I've seen them, you know, and just kind of get that weird look, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. When you when it first threw the rock at you and you saw it coming out of the brush, 
what did you think it was? I mean, did you get a good, I know you got a good look at it when you shot it and we can talk about that here in a second, but when you, I had no, I, I had no idea. It, it, this was so far out of the realm of what was in my head. I had no idea, you know, it was kind of like wild man. Uh, holy crap. You know, uh, I don't, I don't, I have, there was no, there was no idea of what it was I was looking at or seeing. I just knew that this, this ain't normal. You know, this is just, it, it, it I wasn't thinking Bigfoot, you know, or Sasquatch. I'd seen the, the film, the Gimlin film when I was a kid, but I always thought there was one in the world. There's just one out in California that they filmed, you know. I never in my wildest dreams would have thought something like this. And I, I had no idea for the longest time what it was that I saw. And I think that that's why I really never told anybody what I had seen, you know. Yeah. And, uh, it was a long time before I kind of put two and two together. And, you know, it wasn't the, uh, nine, ten foot tall monster. It was about seven foot. It, it, it had the big body. It, well, it had a large, way larger body than an average human. I'm six two. 240 and he was a lot bigger than me but he wasn't the uh, anything that i'd ever heard described before you know and uh so i Wes, i had no idea what it was i would see this was the wildest thing i'd ever seen in my life you know my heart's racing now <laughs> yeah <laughs> just thinking about it you know yeah you always relive it what time of day was this uh, it was around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. It wasn't quite sunset yet, you know. It was, you know, late afternoon. Like I said, I had this feeling I wasn't going to see any deer. Everything was just so dead quiet, you know, except for, you know, some birds that I'd hear every once in a while that just kind of sounded odd. But I just had a feeling that I wasn't, you know, I'm not going to see any deer. And just, so I was leaving, you know, this is just going home, you know, just kind of giving up. And, uh, but yeah, it was in the afternoon, late afternoon. And can you describe for people listening what you saw? Can you describe as best you can? I, I realize to you, this probably felt like a lifetime, but it was probably realistically seconds that went by, but can you describe yeah. what you saw and describe the face and describe basically what, what did you see? Well, it had a face a lot. It looked like a, a lot like a chimp, chimpanzee. But the eyes, it didn't have the brown eyes. It had kind of a black eye, not kind of. They were black eyes, you know. And it had that protruded jaw and lip, you know, kind of stuck out there a little bit. And it had a, a the eyebrow was real protruded, you know. It came out quite a bit with that big uh, hooked, flared nose, you know. The, I think they call it like a hooded nose. Extremely ugly. The, about the ugliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And it had long hair on the head and hanging down on the shoulders and back, you know. But uh, and it was hair. It wasn't fur. It was long, you know, flowing hair. But, yeah, the face looked a lot, just a lot like a chimpanzee. But the body looked more like a man, you know. And uh, I knew it was a male, you know, there was no doubt in that. You could just see the jump, you know, kind of swinging as it was moving. And that just really it just blew my mind, you know. There was one detail that has always stuck out with me, and I don't know why. The, <laughs> the inside of its nostrils were real pink. And I've often thought, why, did, you know, why did I notice that? You know, more than any of the other face facial features, you know, was that, that pink nose, the inside of the nose, you know, real mouth, real wide mouth, black tongue, black inner mouth, white, white teeth. The teeth were, you know, uh, Hollywood movie stars would probably pay for these teeth, you know. They were very, very clean white teeth, and it, it just... That, that's that's a description of the face. How you know. how big would you say the mouth was? Uh, it was probably five six inches wide, real wide. You know, uh, you you could put a softball in this thing's mouth, and you could probably still you know still have room to move it around. 
just a huge mouth. The proportions and the eyes were real big. The mouth was real big. The nose was actually kind of small, kind of uh, flared out, hooded, you know, kind of hooked up. But uh, it wasn't real big. The nose wasn't real big on the face. Your description of the inner nose, that would make sense, especially with, you know, most primates when they get pissed, their nose flare. I mean, even we do it. You'll see guys that or guys and gals, when they get real piss, their nose kind of flares open. Flares um, out, right. Yeah, flares. yeah, I never thought of that, you know, of it, the nose flaring open. I just know that it was, you know, I could see, you know, right into it. You know, how our nose was kind of down. Well, you could see right in, you know, this thing's nose, you know, and it was real pink, and that, that just always stuck in my head is why, why I remember that. As a major detail, I don't know. Did it do any other vocalizations besides screaming at you? No, it just the scream. It screamed at me two times, and then it's well, it screamed at me when it first when I first saw it, and then it screamed at me again at the truck, and then it screamed as it left the truck. And that was that wasn't like the other two. I'm pissed off. That was one like oh shit screen, you know, uh, getting out of there, you know, cause I know I contacted with it. I know, I know I hit it, but I, when I fired, but I think it glanced off the side of the head and the, the eyebrow the, right there, it looks so thick. You, it wouldn't have penetrated anyway. You know, even if I'd have probably hit him dead center between the eyes, I don't think it was that 22 magnet would, uh, would go through there. Cause I mean, it's massive that eyebrow protrusion to just, uh, it's probably, it probably comes out inch and a half to two inches, if not more, you know. So when you hit it, you don't think you actually penetrated the skull? No, no, I don't think, I don't think it did. I think maybe it right over the outside of the left eye and maybe cut it, you know, cut him open right there. But I think it was just, you know, I think what did it was the fact of the pistol is what scared it that and the fire in it right in space but uh i think if i hadn't had that i'd have probably been in a lot more trouble i really do i i don't know what its intentions were but i don't think that it would have came out i would have came out as well as i did yeah the way it came at you was a little bit more than just a bluff charge it's interesting the moment you drop the rifle in the back of the truck it gets the guts to come out and right face you yeah yeah that's that's when it came back out was after i put the rifle down and had dropped the keys you know i didn't have i didn't have anything in my hands you know and that's when it came across the clearing the uh the right of the easement that's when it came across you know to the truck looking back did you get the impression that it was alone you know for the longest time i have you know i, I never ever thought that there was another one with it but, you know, I don't know. It could have been another one that threw the rock at the top. But uh, I don't know. I never I never had a feeling that there was more than one there. But there most certainly could have been. You know, I just, I don't know. And again, that was episode 110, Hunter Shoots a Sasquatch with uh, James. Still one of my favorites. Um, you know, I was thinking about episode 249. You guys hear it in the intro all the time uh, where the guy says it had this look of, I just want to kill you. And that was Steve from episode 249 uh, where this thing ran out. He was on his boat and it actually ran out to the water uh, when he was fishing. Uh, this happened in Florida. Take a listen. Okay, so I guess it's been about, well, Sunday it'll be four weeks now. Um, but I had an upcoming uh, redfish tournament. When I go out to scout for schools of fish, um, I usually take my kayak so my, my uh, motor doesn't scare them, basically. Um, so this particular morning, I got up about 4 a.m., um, got on the uh, boat ramp and uh, dropped my kayak in the water. Had to paddle for about 45 minutes. On the way out there, typically, you know, we'll see schools of, of bait fish or just different things. You can hear different things, uh, cicadas, birds, whatever. Um, this morning it was just, it was, as I 
stated, it was it was church quiet. I mean, it was just it was weird. As I got to my spot, um, or I was coming up into my spot, I got to go behind two of these little spoil islands. Out of nowhere, this huge splash behind me um, occurred, and uh, it literally scared the the heck out of me. And and uh, I it, we have fish down here called mullet bait fish that jump around and stuff like that, but it was a lot bigger. However, um, we do have manatees, and the manatees are plentiful in this area, and I thought, well, maybe I you know, spooked a manatee or, or something. It was just, the splash just came out of nowhere. Um, it was pitch black. Um, there's no lights from the city. Um, there's, there's really nothing. There's two radio towers at NASA that kind of light up um, a little bit of the water, but that's, that's about it. I didn't think much of it after that. Um, you're gonna have to excuse me here because I'm getting the <laughs> I'm getting that uh, chill again. Um, you're good. Take your time. I I continued to paddle on, and it just like I said, everything just seemed different, quiet. I felt like I was being watched, um, or you know that that feeling where your hair stands up on the back of your neck and you get the chills or what have you. And and um, I had have heard about these uh, men in black. Uh, like I said, I was fishing right by NASA property, um, where it's clearly marked every 50 or so feet um, with channel markers stating that you cannot enter NASA property, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, maybe I, maybe I crossed over by mistake. And my buddy had once told me about these guys called Men in Black that come out of nowhere. Once you cross over that property, especially after 9-11, to see what the heck you're up to. Um, but no, nobody's really heard from about that since the uh, space shuttle program has gone away. So anyway, um, I realized that uh, I was at least a mile away. Didn't uh, really pay much more mind to it that, you know, at that moment and, and just continued about my business. Well, <clears throat> the fish that I fish for, the redfish, they, they tend to school up and, and they run up and down the banks looking for shrimp and crustaceans and such. So I get behind the, the island, and I'm right against the shoreline, probably 20 feet off. I hooked the fish. Um, everything was good. Light was coming up. Um, completely forgot about what I, you know, had felt earlier about the splash and such. And once I got into uh, this fish, um, I got to the side of the boat, and uh, as I was taking the spoon out of its mouth, <clears throat> this smell and when I say smell, it was the most horrifying, horrific, disgusting. I, I, there's no words that can describe this smell. You know, for three months now, it's been 100 plus degrees here with the humidity or heat index or what have you. And I'm thinking, okay, well, it's, it's got to be a, a dead animal, uh, something rotting. I released my fish and I'm like, man, I can't stick around here. I mean, I was dry heaving. It was that bad. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, boy, this is tough. <laughs> um, as I, uh, wow, as I got that smell, um, I, I decided I was just going to get the heck out of there. And uh, I probably took three or four paddle strokes, and I jumped a bunch of pigs. I say I jumped them, meaning I hit my paddle hit the water, and these pigs started running wild hogs, um, making this commotion that, I, you know, just, excuse me once again, they, um, you know, running down the bank, the shoreline, the water, just trying to get away from me is what I thought. And uh, as soon as they took off running, this scream came from nowhere. Um, and when I say scream, once again, I, I don't know how to describe it in words. It was the most horrific. I want to say it's, it, it, we have Florida Panthers, and I've, I've actually heard one snarl or whatever you call it. But it was almost like a snarl like that, but with a deep growl that shook my insides to the point that I was, I mean, shaking sick. And these trees, these palm fronds and these trees were just shaking like crazy. And when I say I'm 20 feet off the shoreline, this was maybe not even 10 feet, if 10 feet, um, on the, the shore. Um, these trees and, and everything was just shaking like crazy. I mean, to... Uh, and I know the uh, the sun's starting to come up at this point. 
yeah, it was it was just daylight, and I could see him shaking, and I I was just sitting there in this kayak, which, like I said, I I don't know if I pissed myself. I don't know. I had to pick my job, and what this this screamer, growler, whatever it was, was so intense that I, I honestly I, I have no recollection of what happened really after that moment, other than. I'm sitting there staring at these trees shaking, and I remember seeing this palm frond. And like I said, this happened, you know, four weeks ago Sunday. So I'm trying to, you know, still gather all my thoughts about this because, trust me, I don't want to believe this actually happened to me. But this face came from behind this palm frond and sat there and stared at me for probably 30 seconds. It just continued. I mean, the look on its face, I, I can't tell you. And then with the shaking of the trees and, and everything else, out of nowhere, this thing charged or ran towards me or the water or I don't know if there may have been a pig in between us. I'm pretty sure I would have seen a wild hog, you know, from 20 feet away. But it ran towards me. At, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. It startled me so much. I literally, I have a, a, a sit-on-top kayak with a high seat, a raised seat, 11-inch seat. That I, I mean, it stunned me where I fell off the back of my kayak. Um, and uh, I, I laid in the water because I, I honestly had no idea what to do. This thing stopped probably three feet in the water, which would have taken it, I would say, maybe 15 feet from me, if that. And um, I raised my paddle, um, like I was talking to you earlier, you know, going through survival school in the Coast Guard and all that. I mean, you have that fight or flight, and typically I, you fight. But in this case, I, I couldn't. I, I, I was frozen with fear. I, the only thing I could think of um, was basically, you know, holding my paddle up. I remember guys telling me, I'm not a hunter or nothing like that. But they say if you ever come across the bear – make yourself look as big as possible. Um, I held my paddle up in the air and I'm screaming at this thing, go away bear, go away. And it stopped. It, it just completely stopped right there in front of me, stared at me for a second and then walked away or turned around and walked back towards the woods. As it walked away, it turned and stared at me again. And this look of, I just want to kill you. <laughs> um, but it didn't. It, it, you know, I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. It, it had, you know, all the care, I don't want to say characteristics, but all the emotion of being human. And, uh, but it wasn't. Yeah, no, I've heard that before. Can you describe to the audience what you saw in details? Yeah, I can actually. Um, like I said, I could. I, I probably stared at this thing total of at least a minute. I mean, it seemed forever, but it was probably. I'm guessing seven foot tall. I'm six foot. I weigh two hundred pounds. Um, this thing was probably, I would say, three three fifty. I've never had to judge something like this, but just, I mean, my best educated guess would be that it's. It was completely hairy uh, fur. Um, I would say almost a blackish brown. The face, that's the one thing I, I, I won't forget. Now, like I said, I didn't believe about any of this stuff. I, I searched online at, or after this happened, and um, I, I saw, you know, all these other pictures and stuff, but it didn't have canine teeth. It had a huge, huge mouth, but it was just like normal teeth. Um, but this wide mouth. Its nose looked like a man's nose, flat. But the one thing that got me was like the forehead and the chin were almost at the same, or the furthest out point, they would have been even, I guess is what I'm trying to say. The eyes, there was no eye shine. It was, it, their eyes were black. There was no uh, eye, uh, eye whites. Um, it was just black. The skin um, was like I had – the best way I can say it is my brother had shot a deer up in northern Wisconsin, and he sent down the hide for me to put in my bar. 
and it was like the tanned leather side or the the tan side of the hide. It was like a leather, but it was darkish gray. The face um, from like the cheekbones, which matched a man's cheekbones, just a little bit wider, had hair, long hair, like a biker's beard, I guess you would say. The forehead had a lot of wrinkles, like if you were making a pissed off face or something, you crinkle up your forehead. It was bald on top of its head, and the sides of it, you know, from its ear length down was real long hair. It almost flowed into almost like what you could call a mane on a lion or something like that. But just his gestures, his facial expressions, its body movements, whatever, it was human. I mean, it did everything. I mean, it, it methodically thought about things. It, it, I don't know how else to describe it. It, it. it was human, but it wasn't human. It was, it's, it's absolutely insane. <laughs> what did you think this thing was? I mean, as you're looking at it, what, what's going through your mind? And it's uh, it, charging you. You're in the water, and it's, it's now come out to the water. But what's going through your mind at this point? I, I don't know if there was anything other than survival at that point. Um, do I, 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 I'm probably 100% sure I can say I wasn't thinking of what the hell this is. I'm thinking about how am I going to survive at that moment. Now that I've had three weeks to, uh, literally, um, ponder this and, and, uh, have an anxiety filled last three weeks, um, to the, almost to the point where I can't function. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but. You know, like I said, I've done some research, and I've often wondered about NASA property. I know back in the, I don't know if it was the 50s or the 60s, like I said, I don't follow any of this stuff, but I know they, they launched some chimpanzees up in space or whatever, and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just a monkey that got loose from NASA, you know, because I'm so close to NASA property. And But then, like I said, once I saw it, it wasn't a monkey. It wasn't, it wasn't human, but it wasn't a primate. It wasn't, it was something different. Um, I don't under, I don't understand. I, I don't have the understanding, I guess, of what an actual Bigfoot is or what a Sasquatch is, or if there's a difference, um, or what a skunk ape is, or, but this was so real, so human-like, but yet the strength and the power that it showed to take a, whatever, 10 foot palm tree and shake it like it's nothing. I, I, I can't answer that question honestly. I, I now believe that there's something a lot bigger, badder than a human being that lives here in Florida. Um, <laughs> that's the best answer I can give to your question. So there's more to this story. Uh, Steve decides to go back a month later. He's good friends with a police officer that patrols that area, grew up with them. Uh, told this guy about his encounter. The guy said, let's go out there. Let's take a look around. And this is episode 254. This was an update. I talked to a buddy of mine who's in law enforcement, and uh, he actually agreed to go out there with me. He was pretty excited about it. Unknown to me, um, he had a belief in, in Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And uh, when I shared my experience, it was, it was kind of funny because I called him up. I was still pretty beside myself. and didn't know how to handle any of this stuff. Um, so I called him up, trusted in him, and he came over, and uh, we sat down. I have a I have a uh, bar built out back behind my house, and and we went out there where it was private. I asked him. I said, uh, "Do you believe in Bigfoot?" And he laughed for a second, and he he uh, he said, "What do you mean Bigfoot?" And I said, "Bigfoot, you know." And he he goes, "Why would you ask such a question?" I said, "Well." Um, you know, I haven't been right in the last couple of weeks. And uh, he says, yeah, I know that. Um, you're quiet and you don't call me anymore. and We don't hang out. And I said, well, I said, to be honest with you, I saw Bigfoot. And his uh, eyes got pretty big. And he uh, he said, well, tell me about it. And he could tell that I was, I got really emotional, got, you know, started crying. And, and uh, I said, man, I just got to tell somebody. And if you think I'm crazy, that's cool. I said, I just got to get it off my chest. So I told him my experience and what happened, and as I was telling him, I could see his jaw just continue to drop further and further down, and he uh, he told me flat out that, um, you know, in his line of work, 
that in the last six months in the general area where I was, there's been three reports um, of the same thing. Um, his immediate supervisor, um, my, I, I should go back, my buddy does uh, law enforcement on the water, so he's always on the boat. But his immediate supervisor is on land, and uh, he told him, uh, you know, over the last six months, there's been three other accounts of people calling in and saying that they've seen this, that, or the other. Um, his buddy re or his supervisor responded to all of the calls. He, I guess, once again, I got to go back a little bit further. Sorry about that. But he, uh, he was also telling me that there, um, you know, in these sightings, that only one person who's higher up in law enforcement are allowed to really investigate these things. He, he told me that his boss or his supervisor uh, responded to the calls. He had to make the phone call to the upper supervisor, I guess you would say, who immediately responded, and everybody had to leave except for that immediate supervisor or the upper supervisor. He said that he doesn't really know the stories um, behind them, but all he could tell me was that they were always instructed to say it was a black bear, if there was a smell, it was a roadkill or it was a dead animal, a dead pig. So he's always been curious about it, I guess. He also had stated to me that he, through the grapevine at work, heard that there is a, what they call a book of secrets, that they write all these incidents down. Normally they have to do a full report, but in, if it's anything that's related to this, they um, it, it, it just goes into one book and one person has the uh, responsibility of that book where nobody else can go into it or what have you. Um, so, you know, once we decided that night that we, he wanted to go back with me, um, I agreed. Um, there was just this feeling that I had to return. I mean, I, I needed to know 100% if this was true. And uh, I agreed. Um, so on Friday night, last Friday night, we packed up our boat and, uh, we were going to go spend Friday and Saturday night out there and come home on Sunday. Um, when we were heading out on the boat, every instinct I had was to turn around. I think actually I turned the boat around twice and he grabbed the steering wheel and he turned it back. And we got to the spot. Uh, it was probably about three or four hours before dark on last Friday night. And I was scared senseless. I'm not going to lie. Um, I was shaking. I was physically sick. Um, but he kept assuring me that, you know, we had plenty of guns. Um, he's trained for this. He, you know, we're good. So we, uh, we get to, we, we beach the boat and, uh, we get walking up into the woods to find a place to camp and we find a decent little area. And I just had this overwhelming feeling once again, that there was just, you know, something watching me and I'm thinking, okay, my mind's just playing tricks on me. I saw this, I'm scared. Don't want to be here, but I have to be here. So we get to uh, we get to setting up the tent, start a fire. We're just basically sitting there talking. I'm trying to explain more of the story to him, and he told me um, that uh, he uh, talked to a mutual friend of ours who is a Native American. I don't know. I believe he's Seminole Indian, but you know, many generations passed. But he shared my experience, and this guy knew about it. Uh, knew about this uh, creature that lives in this section or this area of the swamp or the woods. And he said that back in his culture that his people would walk several miles around this swamp so they would not have to go through it. I mean, that was, to, to hear that was really crazy, you know, to go back so many generations. Then uh, he also said that uh, his people always said that, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to quote it the, the way it was, if you ever see this creature, it will be with your soul for life. Now, I don't know, you know, what the hell that meant, but it scares the hell out of me, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, he's I telling, don't blame you. Yeah, so he's telling me this, and, uh, you know, we're just sitting there. we got a nice little fire going, and, and uh, we decided that, uh, you know, it's time to go to bed. We were going to hike around the next day. So um, we got the guns, you know, sitting back behind the tent and he was showing me how to use, I've, I've never had a machine gun. I think it's an AR or something. Um, he's showing me how to use it in case I need to and, and all this. And 
it was good. And uh, so we, we get in the tent, and, and uh, he falls right to sleep, and I'm trying to get to sleep, and, you know, things are going. I mean, I can hear every every creature in the world walking by my tent. You know, it's just my mind, once again, going crazy on me. So I said, well, I'm not going to be able to sit in this tent and not be able to see what's going on outside. So I go sit out by the fire, and, and I'm just reliving everything. And, uh, like I said, sick to my stomach, um, just shaking uncontrollably. I uh, start hearing some, like, footsteps. I'm, like, freaking out. And then I hear sticks break, and, and it was so close that, uh, you know, I, I yell for him, and uh, he's already up. He heard it, too, and he's coming out of the tent with his gun. So he's like, all right. He says, you know, grab a gun, <laughs> and uh, we're pointing in the woods. He's got, a, like, a laser scope that has this, like, a laser beam or whatever, and you can see it hitting the trees. And he's telling me to gently back up towards the water where we come from. So we're backing up, and uh, four or five hogs came out. And I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, it's just, it's pigs. You know, it, we're good. So, you know, that, that was pretty much the end of Friday night. Saturday morning, I guess I fell asleep for a little while. Uh, we got up on Saturday. And he wanted to go down to, um, to where I saw it. I know I told you if I ever had the courage to go back, I'd try to measure the best I could off that stump. Um, so, you know, we did that. And it was between six and a half and seven foot tall. We didn't see any footprints, but it had been a month you know, since that had happened. So I didn't know what to expect, but we did see, you know, broken branches. We did see crushed down palmettos and, uh, you know, but nothing that would be, you know, it could be easily described, you know, where the pigs go through there or what have you. So, you know, that's what we did all day on Saturday. Saturday night, um, it was probably two hours before dark. We, um, we decided we we're just going to fish for a little bit, um, get our mind off of everything. Everything was calm no issues whatsoever and uh we're fishing um back to the woods just down by you know there's where i beached the boat and he all of a sudden um said get your gun get ready and i mean it was out of the blue i didn't hear anything i didn't see anything he just he turned he stared and said get your gun and get it ready and I said, okay. I said, did you see something? He's like, no. I mean, just matter of fact, no. But he wouldn't stop staring at this one section of the woods. And I started slowly backing off as, as well as him. Um, and he, he, I guess it was probably, I don't know, five minutes. He said, let's go. And we walked back. And every two seconds, it was like he was turning around, like there was something behind him. So we get back to where we were camping, and he was a completely different person. I mean, this guy's a complete cut-up. He's cra constantly cracking jokes, always trying to make everybody happy. He did not speak a word. And uh, I kept trying to get him, you know, get stuff out of him, and he, he just wouldn't speak. So we, we sat by the fire, um, and he you could just see the, the – like the life left his face. It, it, she was just different. And uh, we sat there for the next six or seven hours, and, and nothing was spoke, and he just kept looking in the woods. Daylight started coming up. He said, let's get the hell out of here, and we're never coming back. And I, kept, I asked him again. I said, you know, WTF, did you see something? And he goes, no. He goes, let's just go. So we packed up the tent, put out the fire, um, grabbed our guns, and we started walking back to the boat. As we were walking back, in between where we were camping and where we, where we were fishing is like this six-foot tall grass. I just happened to catch it out of the corner of my eye. It was There was like three teepee-like structures made in this grass where like the grass was was pulled up into a pyramid, and there was a hole dug up underneath of it almost and when we walked by it to the opposite side where we had to go i got the smell again that horrifying disgusting smell it wasn't quite as bad as my experience was but it, you could definitely i knew it was the same smell i i you know i don't i'll call him bill for the for the sake of it i said bill do you see that and he said yes 
I said, this was not here yesterday. He goes, no, it was not. I said, do you smell that smell? He said, yes. I said, that smell wasn't here. And he goes, no, it was not. Get on the boat. So I did what I was told, you know, and, and I'm not sticking around. So, you know, we haul ass out of there. And uh, we get home, and I, I dropped him off at home and then, you know, came back to my place. I tried to call him several times on Sunday afternoon. He didn't answer. Um, I called his wife, and uh, she said that he's sleeping. So um, Monday, I get up and do my daily routine and go to work. And uh, he called me, and he said that he had talked to his immediate supervisor and explained what we had done, explained my story. And his immediate supervisor told him that I'm, I'm trying to protect him here. Um, basically, that he should have never done that. He should have not used his uh, law enforcement credentials to, to do such a thing because they do not exist. What we saw or what I saw was a bear, and that he has to now do a full report on him for doing this, knowing he wasn't supposed to, basically. So he does. He, he gets reprimanded. He, he, uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. I don't think anything, you know, suspension or anything like that. Um, I know he got a good talking to this upper supervisor. Who's the only one who's allowed to investigate these sightings paid him a visit and wanted to know word for word, everything that I, I spoke to him and he had no choice. So he told my story and he also, um, told them that we went back out there. They, um, I guess took a full statement and sent them home for the day. They, I know the only thing I know, two things I know for sure that they asked him if he saw it, he said no. And they asked him if, um, he believes that there's a creature out there and he said yes. So, um, from Tuesday, he, uh, came by my place, um, when I got home from work and he said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. He said, uh, when we were standing there fishing, when I heard what I heard, I turned around and it was staring at me, probably 15 feet. He said, I didn't want you to freak out. He goes, I figured you would run. I didn't want you to run. He said, but I don't know if I believed you when you described it. He goes, I didn't know what to think. He said, but whatever you described, whatever the hell that is, was standing in the woods watching us. Of course, that got me going, and uh, I asked him what he saw. He described it almost identical to what I remember seeing. The only thing he said that I don't remember was the hair had dreadlocks. It was like he said it was all matted and dreadlocked and it didn't make any kind of facial expressions other than it stared. I said, okay, well, thank you for not telling me because I really didn't want to see it again. Um, I, I wanted to believe that I was, you know, making this shit up or something, but uh, he, uh, he freaked out and he's still not doing very well. Um, so, you know, dealing with him, I get contacted by a, law enforcement officer who's a upper supervisor and I have to tell my story. He uh, said that I was trespassing on uh, private land, which it's not, but he said that he, if I would tell my story that the trespassing charge and the multiple fines that I could possibly get will be removed and everything will be forgiven and forgotten. So I once again pulled out, I have fishing charts and I have it had the land area and I said well this is public land I was not trespassing we did register with the park service on the island that we uh, that we stayed on so I will tell you my story and you can tell me I'm crazy and we'll part ways so I explained everything to him he wrote down I mean details that I I would never expect somebody to, to, to write down every word that I said to the point where he would stop me so he could catch up with writing. We uh, finished the story. He said, well, from everything that you described to me, it was the bear standing up on its hind legs trying to get something out of the tree. And I said, well, what the hell does a bear eat out of an oak tree or out of a palmetto tree? 
And since when does a bear move a palm frond that he's staring behind? And since when does a bear have a human face that has facial expressions? He says, the law enforcement officer looked at me and he said, none of that happened. And he said, I can make sure that none of that happened. And we shook hands and we parted ways. Sure seem to be a lot of bears out there causing a lot of trouble. Uh, I don't know if the government might want to look into that. A lot of bears out there causing all kinds of trouble. Uh, the encounter made me think of uh, episode 413 with Daryl and his cousin, uh, when his cousin was actually charged by one of these things. And uh, it takes a strange turn, too, as well. Uh, it's called Grassman Gone Wild, and this is Daryl from Ohio. It was October 6th, <clears throat> nice, bright, sunny day. We was doing some bass fishing, me and my cousin. It, I just looked at my phone, and it was 10 till 5, and a rock landed right in front of the boat. And I yelled at my cousin, thinking he made the noise, and he was yelling at me, thinking I did it. Uh, we didn't know it was a rock at the time. And as we're talking out of the corner of my eye, I see another rock coming. It's probably about the size of a bowling ball. And I, I didn't never put two and two together, never thinking it was anything other than a person. And it hit the water, and I looked where I seen it coming from and never seen anything. And my cousin seen a flash go behind a tree. And he thought it was a black man. And he said, take me to shore right now. Uh, we're going to teach him a lesson. So we're in a little 12-foot John boat, flat bottom John boat. We motor up to the island. And before I even get the motor shut off or anything, he's already on the bank and picked up a handful of rocks. And as soon as I step out of the boat, he throws them. He's like right over there behind that tree. And as soon as he threw them rocks, the most ungodly, loudest roar I've ever heard in my life. I don't even know, scream, what it was. Uh, it, it just belted out, and it, it went right through me. I could, If I had long hair, I could picture my hair blowing back in the wind. It was so loud. Just then, it stepped out. And it was behind a tree that wasn't but maybe three feet in circumference. Pretty good-sized tree. And I couldn't believe that I couldn't see it because it wasn't brushy or anything like that. It, it was just there, and I couldn't see it. And it was bigger than a piece of plywood. And <laughs> I, we looked at each other when it, when it screamed. It, it, when it screamed and it stepped out, it was probably two or three seconds. And we just looked at each other and didn't even say nothing. It, we just was like, going to leave. And then it stepped out, and I was frozen in terror. I mean, I was just petrified. Uh, and uh, um, it just stood there for a second, looking real mean at us. And it, it reached its right arm out and wrapped it around the tree. And it was probably three or four feet away from the tree. And it was still able to reach its arm all the way around the tree. And, and it was straight out. And I'm scared to death. Um, I peed all over myself at that time, literally. And just then, it, it in a blink of an eye, it, it charged us. And I just, I was bracing for the impact. And I just knew it was going to rip our heads off. And it made a hard left. And was gone. I'm stunned and in shock and don't know what's up. And I'm still like just frozen in terror. I can't move. I can't scream. I can't do nothing. And I turn around and my cousin's in the water and he's like moaning and everything. And I, I, I didn't know what, I didn't even know it, it, it hit him, but it, it, when it went by, it, it pushed him, hit him something. It, it couldn't have like hit him hard as big as that thing was. It broke four of his ribs. And uh, it punctured his lung, and, and and I had no idea that it did it. And he's trying to catch his breath and, and everything, and I'm like, finally get my crap together a little bit and try to help him out of the water. And he's gurgling and can't breathe, and and I, I drag him up to the boat, and I'm, I'm 
I'm yeah. just terrified. And I'm, I'm standing there. Like I, I get his arms, both his arms and his head's in the boat. It's up on my dry land. And only the ass end of it sticking in the water. And yeah. <sighs> um, then a log come flying and hit him right in the chin. A pretty good sized log. And it hit a tree first before it hit him. And it, it sounded like a gun going off. It was it hit that tree so hard, and it glanced off of it and just hit him in the chin, and and cut it real good. It gave him sixteen stitches or seventeen stitches or staples. And if it wouldn't have hit that tree first, it would have it would have took its head off. Uh, it came with a lot of velocity, and it knocked him out, and. I'm scared to death, and, and, and I'm thinking he's dead. I had a 357 Magnum on me, and he had a 45 on him. And I grabbed his pistol. I get in the water behind the boat. I don't know if I was just trying to get away from it uh, or if my train was kicking in and I was just putting some, some cover between me and it. Yeah. I was in the military, so I have had some extensive training with firearms. And the thought of shooting it never crossed my mind. Why I even took his gun from him, I don't know. But I did. And uh, I'm, my head's on a swivel. I'm looking all around, and I can't see this thing. I don't know what's going on with anything. Uh, it, I'm hollering and screaming for my cousin. I finally walk up to him a little bit, and he's coming around, and blood's everywhere. I mean, everywhere. I thought he was dead. But you, you know how it is when you're all wet and you get blood. It just, you know, it, it exaggerates it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just a big old gash on his chin, but it, blood was everywhere. Whew, hang on a second. <laughs> no, you're doing fine, man. I, I know it's hard for you to recount it. Can you describe for the audience what you saw? You know, a lot of people haven't seen these things. And so in your own words, can you tell us what you, what you guys actually ran into? A monster. Um, a monster. Uh, that, that, I don't know exactly how tall it was. Uh, if it was an inch, it was eight to nine foot tall. Um, it was three, four foot wide. It, it, it was closer to four foot, no, without exaggerating. It, it reminded me of a piece of plywood. It was just so huge. And it, it's its eyes were were big and black. Uh, I hated to look at its face, man. It was the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life, honestly. But not just ugly, but scary. I mean, just scary. And there was nothing kind about this this animal here. This this there there, there was no kindness in it. it. It I've heard other shows and other stories, and th this was not. Uh, creature that wanted to have coffee with me or anything. It wanted to kill us, and I don't know why. I don't. I, I don't know what we did to make it mad. We was being quiet, flipping up towards the bank, bass fishing, and evidently it didn't like us being there. Would you say uh, it looked more human-like? Would you say it looked more like a primate, like a non-human primate? There was, there was nothing human about this thing. The only human thing about it was the way it stood. Uh, it it. It almost moved supernaturally. Um, by no means do I think it was supernatural, but it it was it it was forty yards away from us the first time it come out and it, when it charged us, and it was on us so fast that it, it was you can't even explain how how fast it moved. I, I, there's I can't explain to you how fast it was there. And it was just incredible, but it was so graceful also for as big as it was. It, it's amazing how agile and, and quick it was for his, the size. But it, it, it had a, a nose like a human, uh, I don't know what, what they call it, uh, a hooded nose, is it? Yeah. Uh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do we have hooded noses? Right. 
I guess, but it, it was, uh, it reminded me of a, a boxer that's just been, uh, uh, hitting the nose too many times. It was wore out and, uh, it was pink, bright pink on the inside of its nose. I, I, I was drawn to that for some reason and its mouth. Wow. <laughs> its mouth was huge. I mean, huge. It, it wouldn't have a problem biting your arm off, and, and I mean that literally. And just broad and thick and as black as could be, it was almost like it absorbed the sunlight, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it does. It was, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to describe it uh, like that, but as far as looks, it wasn't human. It was animalistic. It, it had a a human pro or a human shape to it. It's uh, it, its arms were longer from the elbow to the hand than a human's would be. Um, they they weren't really like hanging down to its knees, but they were longer than a human's arms would be as far as like going to your waist. They hung down probably mid thigh or something, and. It's it's hand when it reached around a tree, uh, it, it reached around like we would, but its thumb seemed like it was in a different position than ours. It, it didn't really seem like it was not quite like down like a monkey's would be, but it just didn't seem like it was in the same place as ours. It was just ugly. I'm, I'm going on and on. You ask what it looked like. No, no, you're doing fine. It had big black eyes, and they were really far apart. It kind of looked like it had sunglasses on from a distance. Um, it, it it didn't have a lot of hair on its face. Its face was, was not hairy, but everywhere else was hair. It had a, a mop on its head. Its head looked well-groomed, but the rest of it was matted and and leaves and, you know, debris in it uh it, its skin was a a darker kind of ashy dark ash color charcoal big wide mouth i've said that yeah kind of like it, Pac-Man. Its were far, man it, it's hey yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah its teeth were uh were blocked like ours i didn't see i didn't see any you know major canines or fangs or anything it, it had human-like teeth but big <laughs> big block teeth um for somebody that has never seen this it, it's unbelievable and and i can understand why people don't believe you and it's <laughs> i told my wife about it not too long ago and i was trying to explain it to her i think she thinks i'm a nut but I got a little excited when I was telling her and I was standing on a chair and holding my hand up, you know, like to the ceiling. I'm like, imagine that it's, it's big, as high as the ceiling, you know, and as big as thick as that sliding glass door right there, you know, yeah. it's unbelievable to, to picture that, but that's the truth. And, and oh, just ugly, ugly, ugly and such great camouflage. After it, after it, it, it made that hard left. When it charges, made that hard left. It, it disappeared real quick. I, I, you know, it didn't vanish like poof. It was gone. It just it blended in so well with its surroundings that, that I didn't know where it went. It was perfectly camouflaged. And when it threw that log, I still didn't know where it was. And then there it was, twenty feet away from us when it stepped back out again for the second time, it didn't leave. Yeah. I'm curious and, about that. And, and you're right, Daryl. I mean, you wouldn't think something that big could actually move the way these things move. But I tell people all the time, you know, you run across one of these things and you, you think a hundred feet is a good distance, but in a blink of an eye, it can be on top of you. And they just, they move like you, well, you nailed it earlier when you said it's very, uh, almost supernatural. It doesn't seem like they should be able to move the way they move. But you go down, you get your cousin, and then it steps out again. What what happens next? I'm hollering at him to get get 
you know, I'm like, just get the back of the boat and get it. Let's get going. Let's go. And, uh, uh, he's he's really hurt bad, and I didn't, you know, I didn't understand that at the time. I didn't know that he was hurt as bad as he was internally, uh, and I couldn't figure out why he couldn't move like he was because he got hit in the chin, you know. And I'm screaming at him to hurry up and do this, get in the boat, come on, you know. We're screaming and hollering and cussing, and it just starts looking at us, and then it's swaying back and forth. Uh, when I first, uh, I, I never heard any of these shows up until just several months ago. Uh, I'm not, I don't use the internet very much at all or anything. So I was never up on none of this, but I've listened to a thousand shows since. It, it was swaying back and forth. But to me, at the time, I it, it looked like it was like trying to look around a tree, a different tree, like something was in its way but nothing was in its way. And I, I didn't understand at the time what it was doing. And then it started clicking. It's its mouth. And I think it was doing its teeth, but then I thought it was doing it with its tongue. I, I really not sure exactly what it was doing. It was like making a clicking noise with its mouth. Oh man. <laughs> And then, uh, I don't know, I just thought we was dead. I just froze again when it stepped back out and I seen it again. I, I just froze. I, I was absolutely terrified and I, I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't, I couldn't do nothing again. I was useless. <laughs> and my cousin's hollering. I mean, he's, he's trying to do the best he can. And he's, I mean, he was like hollering at it. Get the hell out of here, son of a bitch. Out. And he's telling me, blow its head off. <laughs> Shoot it. Yeah. And that thought never even entered my mind. I never once raised it, either gun. And I, I didn't know what to do, and I just started praying. And I, out loud, I prayed, and I, I rebuked it in the name of Jesus. And then it, it took a step out, like, towards us. And then it turned around. And then for a split second, I was like, oh, relief. And then it turned back to look at us again. And when it did, it did like everybody says, now that I've heard the shows, but it was different to me at the time because it turned at its waist. It didn't turn its head. It just turned its whole body and looked at us and I was, I just knew I was dead. I just knew it was going to turn around and it was so fast that it, that it was going to be on us. And if I'd have had to crap, I'd have crapped my pants. And then it just took a jump from a standing position and was 20 feet further away. I mean, it literally cleared 20 feet in a single leap. I'm not exaggerating. Now I might be under exaggerating, it wasn't like it got a run ago or anything. It just jumped. And it was 20 feet further away. And then it took off on all fours and was gone. I mean, gone. I never seen something move so fast in my life. And I could, I could keep my eye on it for quite a distance. I was on an island and it, it, it's, it's woody, but it's not a lot of underbrush. And I could see it running for a long time. And I mean, it covered three, 400 yards in just a matter of seconds. Literally. It, it was like a racehorse. It was very comfortable on all fours, but it kind of looked awkward because its head was straight up. If you know what I mean, it, it, it doesn't, it didn't have a neck. It was just that classic Bigfoot thing that you hear all the time. You know, it, its head was just sitting on its body. <sighs> And but its head was like straight up, and it wasn't like knuckle running like a gorilla or nothing. It was down on all fours like a like a a, a cat, it, and that's what it reminded me of was like a cat. It, it was so graceful, to, and when it ran and quick, it, it, and that jump, I mean, it could have jumped on us from where it was. It could have just leaped and been on us. It, it was so impressive. Uh, 
now it's impressive. At the time, it was so horrifying. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I wanted to ask you, too, do you, now that you've had time to stop and really think about this, uh, do you think it was a bluff charge that was an accidental contact, or do you think it intentionally tried to hit one of you guys? I think it intentionally tried to hit him. He's, he threw rocks at it. He's the one that threw rock. It never touched me. Uh, it seemed like it was fixated on him, and he he got out of the boat hollering and screaming, and uh, he was pissed. He was he was mad. He thought some he thought a black guy was out there throwing rocks at him, and I'm like, what in the heck would some guy be out here throwing rocks at us? And when he got out of the boat, he picked up a handful of rocks, and as soon as I stepped off the boat, he threw them rocks at that tree. And then it immediately screamed. And in a couple seconds, that's when it stepped out. We had enough time after it screamed to look at each other. And and we were just like dumbfounded. And, and get the F out of here. And then it stepped out. And then that's, <laughs> I mean, I just, I lost all all control of my myself. And uh, I, I've been in some very stressful situations uh in the service um i was with the second ranger battalion i trained under high stress uh completed missions under high stress and i was totally useless i i I literally that's when i peed my pants everything Yeah, which is understandable. I mean, I've had guys that were special forces. I've had guys that were, you know, high up in the military running into these things. And you'll hear a lot of them say that. They'll say, you know, I've had, I've been shot at, you know, I've been in a war zone and it did not compare to this. This was 10 times that type of fear. This was nothing. This was a hundred times more than that. I've, I've been in the same situation and this was nothing compared to that. I'm shaking right now. Telling, talking to you about this, I, I, I'm trying to keep my composure the best I can to talk to you, but it's hard to do right now. I'm, I'm fixing to lose it right now. No, I understand. Just talking about it, it gets easier with time. I can tell you that. The more we talk about it, it, it does get easier with time. At the at that moment, what did you think you guys just ran into? Whew, a monster. Uh, that a monster. Uh, 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 a, a monster. I, I didn't know. I had no clue. None. Uh, I've, I've hunted literally all my life since I was five years old. I used to be my dad's bird dog and beat on the brush piles. And, you know, he, he'd carry me on his shoulders. Uh, I got my first gun when I was seven. Uh, still got that gun, as a matter of fact. Um, that's besides the point, but... I've I've been in the woods hunting, fishing all my life, and nothing, nothing ever did I see or hear anything like this. I, I had no clue. It, it was a monster. You know, I didn't think, hey, there's a Sasquatch, because it didn't look nothing like the Bigfoot I ever seen on, you know, the that uh, Patterson film. It didn't look nothing like that. Yeah, they're definitely a lot. And it of wasn't wearing things. underwear. It was definitely a big male. It it. It didn't have any other britches on. <laughs> oh, so you did see the private parts of the creature? Oh, yeah. And so what? Yeah, it was a male. And you know what? When it got all excited, when it was swaying back and forth the second time, it uh, it had an erection. Which actually makes sense, you know, with a lot of primates for whatever reason. Uh, I had two brothers, and it chased one of the brothers, and he said it had an erection and was peeing all over the place as it was chasing him. So... I think that's I a normal. I was just. I thought he just thought I was that handsome. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> you had to ruin it for me. Yeah, no, I hear you. And, and Even so, the damn Bigfoot thinks I'm good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and so what yeah, happens? I'm glad I can joke about it now, man. Because I'll tell you, you what, know what tore me up, Daryl. Honestly, you got to be able to laugh at it and joke a little bit about it because if you don't, you'll go insane. When you have an encounter like this, you replay it in your head constantly. You're constantly replaying it in your head and trying to make sense of it. And the fact of the matter is there's no making sense of it, and so it ends up driving you nuts. So it's good to have a a sense of humor about it, even though I wouldn't trade places with you guys and be in that situation, especially having it charge you. Um, 
before we go on to, to what happened next, did you notice any smell or anything when it no, actually came not up? at all. None. And so you're helping your cousin up, and you guys are trying to get back to the boat. It had taken off. What happens next? Uh, after it took off, we took off. <laughs> we didn't waste any time getting out of there. And all I had was a, a flip phone, and we couldn't get any service where we was, and I was trying to call everybody I could. And all we had was electric motor, and we was way far from the boat ramp. So it probably took us 45 minutes or so to get back to the boat ramp. And uh, about halfway there, I finally got some service, and I called the non-emergency number. Uh, I didn't call 911 because I didn't really know what to, to say. And uh, I just told them that we got attacked at uh, where we was and that my cousin was injured real bad and we needed an ambulance. And they're questioning me and and trying to figure out, you know, I'm I'm going, I'm kind of, you know, out of control on the phone, if you know what I mean. I, I was still pretty much uh, scared and excited. And uh, uh, I just hung up. I, I talked to him, told him where we was, what we needed, what boat ramp we was at. And then I just got tired of answering questions and, and I hung up. And I'm talk, trying to talk to my cousin and he's spitting up blood and stuff. And, and I know he's really hurt bad. And when we finally got back, it was going on dark. And there was a, a policeman, a park ranger, and a game warden there. And we start to tell them what's going on, and uh, there's nobody even attending to him. He, they're just, like, more interested in questioning us, almost like we was suspects instead of, you know, the victim. Uh, they, when we started talking and, and telling them all this, you know, uh, the park ranger and the uh, cop took me aside a little bit, and the uh, game warden was talking to my cousin, and they were just basically, oh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, what were you guys drinking? Uh, was it a boat accident or what really happened? And I'm trying to explain to the guy, you know, and the one guy's like, oh, it was a bear. I was like, a bear. I was like, you really think we got attacked by a bear? And I'm not being nice about it, you know. I'm I'm excited. And, uh... I was like, then why doesn't he have claw marks all over him? Why isn't his shirt ripped? What, what's, you know, I was like, it wasn't a freaking bear, man. It was a monster. And the guy kept insisting it was a bear. And the one cop pulled me aside. The only cop that was there pulled me aside. And he's like, look, he's like, just calm down a little bit. He's like, he's like, I understand. He's like, I, I he's like, I believe you. And I'm like, no, you don't. You know, I was like, you're just tending to me. I was like, this is really what happened. He's like, no, I believe you. And so I got mad and, and about 20 different cars showed up that by then. And I just took my cousin and, and helped him in the truck and I took him to the hospital. The ambulance, there was no ambulance there or nothing yet. And I took him to the hospital and, uh, that, that game warden, that cop and a sheriff come to the hospital and they wouldn't let us go in together. They, they separated us and was questioning me and I, they were tending to him and I can hear him yelling and screaming, telling him what happened. And he wasn't taking no for an answer. He was, you know, telling them, you know, BS, you know, F you, <laughs> this is what happened. The cop was there and told me, he, he took me aside after probably about an hour or so of arguing with everybody that about what was going on. He took me aside and, and told me, he's like, look, he's like, I believe you. I told you I did. He's like, I seen one myself. He's like, it was a few years ago. I was hunting. This is what happened. Boom. I believe you. He's like, just, just cooperate and, and talk. And he's like, the bear thing. <sighs> He explained to me uh, what was going on. He's like, look, 
He's like, we can't put on there that you got attacked by no damn monster. He's the one that called it a Bigfoot. And then when he said that, it kind of like clicked. That That's when it really hit me that that's what that thing was. I got, I left, I got out of there um, after about another half hour or so. And that cop came to my house the next day and, and talked to me about it and, and told me about his encounter. And he gave me the phone number to get a hold of uh, the other guy I talked, spoke with prior to this. Yeah, Lan- on the other show. Yeah, yeah. Lance from the uh, it's Cryptid Brothers, right? Cryptid Brothers, yeah. Yeah, I've talked good to Lance. Yeah, Real Lance, guy. great guy. I've talked to Lance a couple times. Very good guy. Good yeah. Guy. If it wasn't for him, I'd have went nuts. I, I really would. He, yeah. He he was a godsend. That man will be my friend for the rest of my life. Good, good, good guy. And so I know you went on the show. You talked about it. And so what kind of happened after this whole incident? What happens next? Um, that, uh, the next day uh, at the hospital, uh, those two schlep rocks showed up that everybody talks about uh, on your show now and other shows, I guess, too. The, uh, the biker dude and uh, the other guy, they spoke with me. And, and my cousin, and basically told us that, you know, BS, you was attacked by a bear, and that's that, and leave it alone. That That's basically what it come down to. About an hour after arguing with them, that's what it come down to. And my cousin wouldn't even talk to me for a long time. I don't know what they said to him or did or whatever, but he wouldn't even communicate with me on the phone, anything. They took his phone, my phone, uh, and wanted to know who who all we told this to and everything, you know, all the rigmarole that goes with it. And we was both being defiant to them. You know, we had no idea what was going on, not a clue. You know, uh, like I said, neither one of us had any idea uh, about a Bigfoot or anything that government cover-ups or, you know, it, it it just was overwhelming to us that, that this would happen, especially over that. If we did get attacked by a bear, why is it in every newspaper telling everybody to watch out when you go fishing there that there's a, a dangerous bear and you, you might get attacked? You know, it, they would that there'd be signs everywhere. And that's what I kept telling them. Why won't you just tell everybody, be careful when you're there. Carry a big gun. And I mean a big gun. And they wouldn't even, that's what got me, is they wouldn't even agree to the bear thing. You know, they're the ones telling us it was a bear attack, but now they won't even agree to it. You know, I was like, well, then let's put it in the newspaper that the bear's out there attacking people, so you better leave, you know, stay well enough away from there. And, uh... The the last thing he said to me is, he, his exact words was, you just leave this alone and we'll handle it. And I know that uh, show actually got a little bit more strange. I know medical records disappeared. Those guys got a few more visits um, and all over a quote-unquote bear. Sure funny, a bear gets blamed for um, <laughs> it was no bear. Um, and the other encounter I want to share with you is always been one of my favorites. It's uh, Mike Woolley from Louisiana, episode 260. Uh, and he's in the intro of the show where he says the eyes are real, real evil. Uh, here's Mike's encounter. Back in 1981, it was a typical day. It was a uh, weekend, and I was going to go deer hunting. And uh, I had a place uh, in a wildlife management area, uh, I don't know, seven, eight miles from my house where I hunted. Uh, it was, uh, that day would have been the fifth day uh, it was the fifth time to go hunting there. It was uh, a new place that year. A friend had showed it to me. And I took a stand in there, a lean-to stand, and uh, uh, it was made out of heavy-duty pipe, and had a plywood seat, had a V-cut in it, and you just lean it up against a tree. And what I'd do, I'd take a big, heavy logging tra- chain and lock, lock it, you know, to make it steal it. Uh, at the end of the season, I'd go back and extract it and get it out of there. Uh I was working the shift job, 311, uh, 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 plywood plant, uh, 
you know, not far from my house, a mile. And uh, what I would do, I would, uh, you know, get off 11 o'clock at night and go home, get something to eat, get a shower, go to bed, get up about 4, go hit the woods, and I'd hunt about 11, and then I'd come in, lay down a couple of hours, and then go to work. Now, I did this every day. And on the weekends, I was off, so, you know, I had a little bit more time. But anyway, uh, that week, we had a really rough uh, uh, week on the job. I mean, it was stressful. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And so I was really looking forward to being able to go deer hunting uh, that weekend. You know, really look forward. Uh, so uh got off Friday night and uh, uh, went and drank a beer, you know, kind of relaxed a little bit. Got cleaned up, got all my gear ready, got the truck loaded up. So next thing I know, uh, that morning, uh, the birds woke me up, uh, chirping outside the house. It must have been about 9.30, and I said, oh, crap. You know, I done overslept. You know, I missed the alarm clock. You know, I was really tired, so I was, yeah, I was kind of PO'd, you know, about it. And I thought, you know, uh, I got chores and stuff I need to do, some errands I need to run, so I'll just do this, finish the morning out with that, and I'll just make an evening hunt. I'll go hunt in evening time. Well, I did, and... uh uh, I left the house about mm, 2.15, 2.20 uh, on my way to my deer stand. What I did, I drove down this main highway, and I turned off the highway and, and go back down this old dirt road, oh, about a mile and a half, something like that, and uh, turned back to the left down this old damn logging road. You know, it probably hadn't been logged 20 years. But uh, anyway, uh, it, it run back and dead-ended uh, about a mile uh, in the woods. And about a halfway uh, down that logging road, at a half mile mark, uh, I would turn my truck around. I'd always turn my truck around face out where I could get out of there if I had to in a hurry, you know, in case of a medical emergency or something. Uh, and so there was a place there, I could, uh, a little room there, I could do it, you know, where they had loaded logs at one time. You know, the trucks would beat it all down. But uh, anyway, I would uh, get out of my truck and uh, ease back there. Uh, really, really quiet, and uh, my uh, deer stand uh, was at the end of the logging road, uh, and it was really, really tight hunting back there. I mean, it's grown up. Uh, you really couldn't see. Uh, longest shot probably would have been uh, 40 yards, maybe, you know, and so uh, <clears throat> I went back there and got on a stand, and I always kept logs back then. I uh, wrote down everything, you know, the day, the weather, the temperature, you know, what I did, all that. But uh, that particular day, it was a bluebird day, best sky. I mean, it, it was beautiful. Uh, wasn't no clouds in the sky. The sun was bright. You know, it's about 30, between 30, 35 degrees, you know. No wind was blowing. I mean, I thought, man, I ought to do something to give me one today at least. Well, I get on my stand about 3 o'clock, and I check my watch. My stand's facing to the north. And so, I don't know, it's 10 foot, about a 10 foot deer stand, you know. And so I get up there, and I'm sitting there, you know, and uh, nothing's happening, you know, just looking around, you know. So about uh, 320, I heard some rustling coming from the, uh, uh, the east. And uh, I, was, I slowly turned my head over to see what's going on. Next thing I know, uh, this little young doe, uh, deer, she come running on my deer stand and uh, laid down uh, under my deer stand. And she was actually, uh, her front legs was actually touching uh, the left side of the, the pipe on the deer stand. It went, you know, in the ground. And uh, she was really panting. Uh, uh, just really just wore out. And uh, uh, I thought, you know, well, the rut was on. I mean, if everybody knows what the rut is, I see, you know, when the uh, uh, the breeding you know, time is and, and uh, the bucks get kind of crazy, you know, they get to where they don't care, you know. That's how a lot of them get killed, the big bucks, because they get their mind on one thing. And uh, so that's, that's what I thought, you know. But, uh, uh, I had tried to walk back there and look around one time, and it was so so many briars. Uh, we've had those big uh, thorn trees down here, and they got four or five inch thorns, and they're razor sharp. I mean, they'll cut you open like a knife, and you have to be careful because they will break. 
And, uh, man, they'll get up in you. Know, you got to have surgery just about to get that out. So, it, it, you know, if it gets infected, you're really in bad shape. Well, that's that's what I thought. So out of my peripheral vision, as I, as I turn, slowly turn into look, I see something uh, about two about two o'clock position. Uh, it, it come up real quick, uh, got behind a tree. And uh, I saw something tall, uh, black, you know. Uh, it, 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 I, it looked at me and I looked at it and, uh, I'm like, you know, it was happening so fast. You really didn't have time to think about nothing. I mean, I thought, what the heck is this? So this thing, it hopped flat footed. I mean, it didn't get a backup and get a, like a running start or, or like a, a runner does, Olympic, Olympic runner. And it just stood flat footed behind this tree and jumped 20 foot. Went through the air, got off the ground three, four feet, and landed directly uh, behind uh, this tree that's about three o'clock, facing my stand from the uh, east, and landed behind this big uh, uh, oak tree, kind of like a black oak tree uh, we have down here. And uh, I couldn't, man, that just blew my mind, seeing something that big uh, go through the air that easy, you know. Um, I don't know what uh, it was up to. I don't know if it was going to try to uh, work itself around me and go the other way. I, I don't know. But uh, I'm sitting here. I'm looking at all this. I'm trying to take this in. And uh, it's just like uh, I couldn't believe what my eyeballs uh, were showing me. You know, I, you just can't believe that something that, you know, seven, eight foot tall, 500 pounds, uh, black and hairy, got a face like a human. Uh, you know, uh, but anyway, I was staring at it and it was staring at me and, uh, uh, I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil, uh, in its eyes, the way it was looking. It was like, it wanted to make a hundred percent eye contact with me all the time. Like, uh, I, I it actually, I feel something like it was drawing, like it was trying to look at my soul, you know? And uh, uh, it, it, it was real scary. I mean, uh, I've never in my life been that uh, afraid. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I had that high-fired deer rifle, and uh, uh, I, I was still afraid. I mean, uh, he, he made me feel like uh, that rifle was a BB gun, you know. And so uh, this went on, and I kept hoping and, and praying, you know, like maybe this thing will leave, maybe he'll turn and, uh, go back to the way he come, and I'll just head back to my truck, and I'll never come back here. They can have a deer stand. You know, I ain't worried about it. But that didn't happen. And uh, oh, it, this, it's, it goes on in time, and uh, uh, he's staring at me. And uh, I got real, I don't know how to say, but I got real clammy. It was, you know, it was it was 30 degrees, but uh, I got clammy. Uh, my throat got real dry. Uh, I got dizzy nauseated my stomach was just kind of tying itself up in knots uh i was shaking i I never forget uh i'm sitting there and it's just like i hear buzzing going on in, in my in my head and it's like time is stood still or something uh you know it's kind of like i'm, I'm going around in a real real slow circle and and every now and then I could see something, you know, part of my life or something. And it, it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Never in my life, it, you know. But uh but anyway, uh this 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 rocked on. I'm thinking, you know, uh I'm in a situation here and I'm gonna have to make a decision on what to do and it's gonna affect my life. Uh it's gonna affect me the rest of my life, whatever which whatever I do. You know, whether I live or die. So, uh, the thing, it looks so human. I mean, the sun was shining down through some breaks in Thompson Tree, and I remember the hair on his shoulder, how shiny it was. Uh, I thought, man, this is somebody in a costume or something, because there's no way that this thing's real, you know. Uh, uh, you know, because it's so shiny. And, and I actually, uh, I talked to this thing to, uh, to, to take that suit off and get out of here, take that head off and get out of here, you know. 
And I'll never forget, he was he was looking at me as I was talking to him. He was he was looking at my lips, uh, my face, you know. But uh, I got to looking how big it was, you know. And I thought, I mean, there ain't no way somebody could get a suit uh, that big. And, and there ain't no way somebody could have hopped 20 foot through there that big, you know. And then it's just like, my, I guess my soul was talking to me. I don't know, God, questions was coming up. And like, you know, is there a circus in town? No. Uh, has anybody heard or got a report of a gorilla escaping, escaping from somewhere? No. I mean, it's just like that. Why? Wow, just fast, you know. And uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I'd done. I'd read some a book on some feral humans one time. I don't, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, I thought, well, maybe this is a feral human, you know, and. If I shoot this thing and kill it, you know, I've got to only the rest of my life. You know, I, I committed a, a homicide, you know. And I said, well, you know, I don't know whether this thing's going to commit a homicide on me. One of us, you know, it's, it's gonna, it looks like it's going to be somebody's day to die. And I, I sure didn't want to be the guy, you know. Uh, but anyway, I, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to look through my scope. I had a three minute high power scope. And I said, I'm going to look through my scope at this thing, his face and all. I'm going to make sure uh, this has no kind of human uh, in it. So I um, put my, make sure my scope's turned down real low because you can't have them turned up high, hunting that close. I always turn them down to three, you know, when I'm hunting really tight situations. I take, turn the scope down, and I turn to the right. And I looked through my scope at this thing, and oh man, uh, you could see the, you know, it was kind of cold at the cool that day. And uh, as you would breathe, you could see the, you know, how it is in cold weather, you you, you blow that uh, moisture out through your nose and your mouth, you know. And, and I could see him breathing, I could see that coming out. And I looked at his eyes, you know, uh, uh, really black. Uh, and I could see his uh, eyebrow, you know, I eyelashes moving, uh, everything. And I said, oh, crap. I said, you know, I, I'm in a situation, you know. And all of a sudden, uh, he, he got mad uh, because I pointed that rifle at him. He got kicked. He, man, he, he, he wigged out. Uh, uh, he he growled at me, and uh, uh, it was like a, 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 a pissed off, excuse the language, African line. Uh, uh, I mean, if you'd have been a mile over a mile away, you could have heard that. And, and here I am about 15, 15 yards from him, you know, and, uh, uh, it, it, it was like getting hit by a 70 mile per hour wind. I mean, it, it like, and I think the reason he roared at me is because I pointed the gun at him because I, after that, uh, until, you know, I left, uh, he was mad. Oh man, he was mad. I mean, he, he, he lost it. I mean, he he went that put him over the edge, pointing a gun at him. He uh he started stomping. Uh, I call it getting froggy the way he was doing. Uh, he uh started beating uh, on the tree, and and you know he was standing behind the tree. And he started beating with the insides of his fist, not like a direct punch, well boxer punches, but the sides of his fist in the tree. Now, he was mad. I mean, you, you you could hear him hitting that tree, man. It, it, I thought, man, if I'd have been a human's head, he'd have been hit. It, it, oh. But uh, anyway, uh, a whistle, uh, a real shrill whistle, come back to him uh, from the from the northeast. Uh, I would say anywhere from seventy five to hundred yards, uh, a real shrill whistle. And uh, he looked over at it. Turned his head to the right, looked over there, and then he turned his head back, and looked at me, and he gave me a grin. I mean, you know, uh, you know these some, these things uh, they're smarter than what people think they are. He, he, uh, he gave me a grin, you know, like now, you know, uh, we're going to go to school, you know. So he whistles back to uh, this thing. He barely turns his head that way. He's still looking at me, kind of half and half, and he gives a he gives a shrill whistle back. Uh, you know, I know you said you've worked uh, in some mills before, 
And you know how, like, when it's got time to go to break or something like that, it's usually done by a whistle. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and you know how that whistle sounds. It's a shrill whistle, you know, and it picks up. Well, he did that back. And, and you know, I mean, bells went off my headlights. I said, you know, all the years I've deer hunted, I have heard that whistle. And, I, and matter of fact, I've been on top of it before, that close. And uh, I thought it was a bird doing that. You know, uh, I've heard the wood knocks. Uh, I thought it was a woodpecker or something. You know, I didn't know. Well, anyway, when he uh, to give his whistle back response to this whatever it was, I heard this thing, a uh, bipedal movement coming to him. Uh, uh, evidently, it was a signal to each other. I don't know if it was, I was in trouble or whatever. Come on, help me out. But it started coming his way. And he's sitting there, he's standing there looking at me, kind of got a sheepish grin on his face, you know, and I'm like, something's telling me, you know, uh, you got to go, you got to go, either, either uh, you know, one way or another, you know. And, you know, I, I got to thinking, I said, you know, I know what he's going to do. He's going to wait till his buddy gets up there, and they'll be standing shoulder to shoulder looking at me. And then what they'll do is they'll put a, a charge and they'll split on me. You know, want to go to the back of the stand, and and then uh, I'll be trying to focus on the, the one that's facing me to try to, you know, take him out and probably want him to hit him and the other one to come up behind me. And I said, you know, uh, it's kind of like shooting uh, fish in a barrel. You know, I ain't got a chance, you know. So uh, I started coming down the stand and got about halfway down and I jumped off the stand. And I was young back then, you know, probably 26, something like that. 25, 26, real light and could run. And, but, man, my legs felt like they weighed uh, 500 pounds a piece, you know. And so I'm running uh, down uh, the logging road trying to get to my truck, which is a half mile away. And uh, I look over my shoulder uh, as I uh, uh, start going, you know, up the road to my truck to see where he is. And here he here he comes. You know, I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, I'm, uh, I was hoping that he would, you know, turn and uh, uh, go the other way. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I just I started running the best I could, and, and uh, he was kind of uh, flanking me. He was about, I don't know, uh, from where I was. He was about 50 feet from me. Uh, he was uh, running through the woods, and, I mean, he was just – he wasn't even – he he was mowing down trees and brush. I mean, he didn't care. He was uh, uh, those big thorn trees, but uh, uh, you know, got five and six inch thorns. Uh, they're black and they're just uh, they cut you pieces. They're deadly. He was running through them. I mean, that's what scared me when I saw what he was doing, you know, the aggression and what he was putting his body through to try to catch up with me, that's what scared me. I said, oh, man, this this thing really wants me, you know, bad. And, I, you know, uh, it, I automatically went from me thinking maybe he was trying to bluff me, uh, you know, scare me out of the area. Uh, but when I saw what he was doing, I said, he really, this thing wants to kill me, you know. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we're moving on, you know, and I could hear him, oh, 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 oh. he was just a grunt and, and, and just, you know, really like a bull, you know, when a bull really gets uh, agitated and he gets mad, you know, uh, you know, the grunts and stuff he puts out, you know. So I'm going along there, and uh, uh, I'm coming up to my truck, and uh, as I get about 75 feet from it, you know, things start going off my head. You know, well, you got to unlock it. You got to get in there. You got to crank it up. What are you going to do about that? Uh, when you turn your back, you know, this thing's going to nail you. So... I'm getting up about the tailgate of my truck. I take, uh, you know, I think, man, I got to me some time. I got to do something, you know. So anyway, I, I, I spin around and I, I shoot my rifle from the hip. Uh, it's kind of like a warning shot. You know, if I, I turn towards him and uh, the bullet hit the, uh, the, let me see, each side of an old pine tree, uh, it was a big tree, but it wasn't really a big, big tree. And uh, it, it determined, I mean, uh, these uh, uh, pine beetles 
uh, mustard got in it because the tree was just eating up real bad. Uh, the, I seen it's a bullet hit about seven foot on the backside of that tree. Uh, the creature was roughly about three feet from it. And I mean, it's just a big old cloud of uh, blue, black looking uh, dust coming out of the tree right there all over. Well, I get, I'm done running my truck, get it unlocked, get it cranked up. And I, I mean, I throw her in gear and I'm going. Man, I'm, I'm just, I'm smoking it, getting it out of there. I look my rear view mirror, and I see a big old black hand uh, reaching for the tailgate, you know. And he had run away in the truck. I guess he was going to try to get in it. I don't know. But uh, and when I got on down to the uh, road there where I had to go around the curve and slow down, I looked my rear view mirror, and there was another one uh, standing by him. So evidently, I guess the one that... Uh, signal him uh he was pulling up the rear i never saw him of course i didn't look over my back that way i wasn't looking on my back because this thing i was looking to the side left side of me you know because he was running to my side uh i didn't look in the back you know sometimes you're actually afraid to you know it, it could slow you down but uh anyway i got to my truck and uh got in and got out of there and uh but you know i have a lot of people tell me that uh uh I was trying to take food off the table and, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. And they were mad and, uh, uh, they were just trying to kind of escort me out of there. But, you know, when you see something, you, you go through what I went through and you, you know, you're in your truck, you're trying to leave. I mean, you're trying to end that situation. You're leaving and it, it runs your truck down and tries to get into the back of the truck with you. What's you want to, what, what's you want to do then? You know, uh, so you know, it, 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 that was a rough day. <laughs> One of the roughest days of my life, you know. And again, that was episode 260 with Mike Woolley. You know, I've heard Mike's encounter a million times, and I still enjoy listening to him retell that encounter. Uh, hopefully some on my list was the same ones you guys had on your list. Believe me, I could have done my top 50. It was very hard to pick the shows I wanted to play for you guys. There was many others I really wanted to play. But I appreciate you guys hanging out with me this holiday weekend, and I appreciate all the years of listening to the show. Many more great shows to come. Happy holidays, and I will see everyone next time. Sky